Danger! Danger! Wizard of Paws. We're about to enter the realm of the unknown, called blockchain. I have seen many explanations of blockchain. Most like to skip the most complicated parts. I'm hoping my presentation will help clear up the complexities associated with blockchain. So what are the blockchain characteristics? Well, first, permissions. Blockchains can be permissioned or permissionless. With permissioned blockchain, each participant has a unique identity, which enables the use of policies to constrain network participation and access to transaction details. With this ability to restrict access, more transaction detail can be stored in the blockchain and participants can specify the transaction information they are willing to allow others to view. Immutability. No participant can tamper with a transaction after it's been recorded to the ledger. If a transaction is an error, a new transaction must be used to reverse the error and both transactions are then visible. Consensus. For a transaction to be valid, all participants, called miners, must agree on its validity. Speed. Pure digit digitization of assets streamlines transfer of ownership, so transactions can be conducted at the speed more in line with the pace of doing business. For example, instead of the 7 to 10 days it typically takes to transfer money internationally, a transfer via blockchain can occur in just a matter of a few hours. Public or private. Blockchain can be completely open to the public and allow anyone to join, or it can be totally private, only with only certain folks allowed access to the data, or allowed to send and receive payments. You own your personal information. No more storing credit cards, medical records, or identifications on a centralized database to prove your identity. Your information remains yours, private and secure. This ties to permissions. Contract. A smart contract is an agreement or set of rules that govern a business transaction. It's stored on the blockchain and is executed automatically as a part of a transaction. Participants know where the asset came from and how its ownership has changed over time. So what is a transaction that can be stored on blockchain? Well, it can be tangible, a house, a car, cash, land, or intangible, like intellectual property, such as patents, copyrights, or branding. So in one case, it's an instance of buying or selling something, a business deal. It's the action of conducting business. It's a negotiation or exchange of, or interaction between people. It's a published report of proceedings at, at meetings or of learned societies. And finally, it's an input message to a computer system that must be dealt with as a single unit of work. So we've seen what a transaction is. So what are the components of a blockchain transaction? Well, the transaction starts with the information being recorded. We just saw that. It can add terms and conditions to be part of the contract. There's a timestamp for when the transaction occurs. Finally, there's a block ID, and this makes it easy to look up previous blocks once time has gone by. So now that we have a transaction and how its components are recorded in blockchain, what is blockchain? A blockchain is an open, public, anonymous, peer-to-peer -peer ledger. There are two components to blockchain, the information and the storage. The information is recorded in something called a ledger. And the ledger has two parts, the transaction and the contract, as we've seen. And the ledger can be used to secure all, securely store all kinds of information, like financial data, or medical information, or production logs, or anything, basically any kind of transaction. And the ledger is securely and immutably stored in the storage called a block, hence the block part of blockchain. Every transaction occurring on the network, the blockchain, is tracked and recorded publicly throughout the entire network. Anyone can, at any time, verify each and every transaction 
Trust is created by design and by, by default. This ledger is shared among all participants in the network. Through replication, each participant has a duplicate copy of the ledger. It's permissioned, so participants can only see those transactions they are authorized to view. Participants have identities that link them to the transactions, but they can choose the transaction information that other participants are authorized to view. It's decentralized. That's just a fancy way of saying there is no central hub where the transaction data is stored. Instead, servers and hard drives all over the world hold bits and pieces of these blocks of data. And it has three purposes. First, it ensures that, one no party, that no one party can gain control over a cryptocurrency and blockchain. It also keeps cyber criminals from being able to hold a digital currency hostage should they gain access to the transaction data. Second, by removing the middleman from the equation and working around the traditional banking system, it allows for smaller transaction fees if you're dealing in like the Bitcoin. Third, and maybe most important, blockchain offers the potential to process transactions considerably faster than traditional methods. So we've seen how a transaction is and what's involved in, in, in a transaction. Let's start talking about how to build a blockchain. And of course, it starts with a transaction. On top of that, they take the previous block's hash and add it to the current block. Miners, or people with other computers who are used to verify things, take the hash of a transaction, combine it with the hash of another transaction, and rehash that into a new, smaller hash. Combining transactions in this way is known as a Merkle tree. And I'm not going to get into that because it's fairly complicated. The new block's hash is created by these designated miners, and the miners within a blockchain implementation must execute algorithms to evaluate and verify the history of the individual blockchains that is proposed. If a majority of the miners come to a consensus that the history and signature is valid, the new block of a transaction is accepted and added into the ledger. And that is simply repeated. As new transactions, new, new hashes are created and validated by these miners. Then the whole block gets, gets calculated and a timestamp gets put on top of it. And then we move on to the next block. This block now becomes immutable and you can't go back and change it. So what is a hash? Well, first, it standardized the message into a 64 character length string. You can have transactions of different sizes and complexities, and they all get changed into a string of 64 characters. Whether it's a word or a whole paragraph, any text can be standardized into this 64 character hash. Basically, a hash is a mathematical function that converts an input into an arbitrary length of an encrypted output of a fixed length. And that's as deep as I'm going to get into that. It's unique. The way the cryptographic algorithm works, it changes even one character of the original text gives you a totally different output hash. It's deterministic. As long as you enter the exact same original input, you always get the same output. If you use such a function on the same data, the hash will be identical. And it only works one way. This is called pre-image resistance, and the output of a hash is directly tied to the input, but it would be incredibly difficult to work backwards and figure out the input given only the hash's output, so it cannot be reverse engineered. So we've been talking about how blockchains are validated with something called a miner. Well, there are actually two primary ways that transactions on a blockchain are validated. One's called the proof of work, and the other is the proof of stake. The proof of work system is the one we were talking about, and it involves giving all the computers on the network a very difficult problem. The computer choose who's to compete to solve this problem, and they are called miners. After each miner compiles the current block, they begin the process of solving the difficult puzzles for that block. The first computer on the network to solve the problem receives a prize, 
and the block that computer compiles is accepted across the network as the new block in the chain. The price for solving the problem is called a block reward. For Bitcoin, a block reward is placed as a fraction of a digital Bitcoin. Because of the sheer number of complexity of the problem, it takes a lot of electricity. So this makes this a very expensive model. In fact, if you had a, a major company like a Walmart, you could basically take the network down by trying to solve blocks for everything you sold all day long. So that led to another model called proof of stake. Now the proof of stake, rather than using tons of electri electricity in a competition to solve the equation, the computer with the most coins gets to solve the problem. The more coins you own of a virtual currency, the more likely you are to be chosen to validate the blocks and to add it to the blockchain. After you submit the block to the network for approval, someone else will get a chance to assemble the next block. So you won't get to create a new block again for a period of time. As for the rewards, the proof of method, proof of work method hands out block rewards as virtual coins. As noted, the proof of stake model rewards its individuals with the transaction fees paid by the users of the block that's being verified. Thank you. I am the Wizard of Pi. My name is Richard Alter. Please check out my book, Art for Retail, using technology to turn your consumers into customers and make a profit. It's available on Kindle. Thank you.